All right, good morning, everyone. We are gonna go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Kate Audette, and I am the Director of State Government Relations here at Boston Children's Hospital, and I'm thrilled to see so many of you have joined us here in Folkman Auditorium, as well as live streaming for today's um, Children's Advocacy Network We Can Vote event. So this is actually a day-long enterprise day of action where we are going to be conducting nonpartisan voter registration and education efforts across the enterprise here at the main hospital and our satellites. And then in addition, the signature piece of today's efforts is this one hour long speaking program where we are going to cover three different things. We're going to talk about general voter registration and education information that is important for all Massachusetts voters to have. And then second, we're going to talk about two specific ballot questions, question number one and question number three, which we will get into um, in depth during this one hour program. So we have a lot of amazing speakers that have joined us today. So to ensure that we can get through all of our speakers, we are gonna hold questions until the very end of today's program. And the way that we will navigate questions is that for those of you here in the room in Folkman, you've been given a note card. So you can feel free to jot down any questions that you have as we go throughout the program. And then at the conclusion of the speaking program, we'll be collecting those notes cards. Now, if you've joined us online via live stream, you can type your questions into the chat box at any time. When we get to the Q&A portion, we'll consolidate both the questions from online and in the room. We'll look for questions that have similar themes, and then we'll try to tackle as many of those as we can in the remaining allotted time. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. I am excited to welcome um, our CEO, Sandra Fenwick, to the stage to bring you greetings to kick off today's speaking program. Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, first of all, thank you all for taking time out of, I know, um, very, very busy days and, and times. And um, so I just want to uh, emphasize what, what Kate said, that um, we're honored to be able to host this because it is a topic of real importance uh, to us as citizens, to us as an organization, and obviously to us as a country. And so I think one of the things we want to do is, is really talk today about kids. Um, obviously, that is our focus, and it is what's important to us. And um, although kids can't vote, we certainly can. And when we vote and we keep kids in mind, we're doing as much for the children um, as, as, as we can, not only caring for them, not only providing them a safe and, 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 and good uh, environment to live, to work, I mean, to uh, go to school, uh, but also all the issues that um, all of this voting and everything else really um, has to do with them. So while elections are important, this one is particularly important on Tuesday, November 6th. And I think one of the things we want to do is really uh, have a dialogue, have a discussion about the issues that are in front of us. Um, voting is a very important privilege for all of us. And um, just so you know, um, I'm going to be out of town that day, and I can't vote here. So I went and tried to get my absentee ballot. So don't leave it to the last minute, because they have to mail it to you. They won't hand it to you. So um, I, I found that out yesterday when I tried to get my ballot so that I could make sure that I had an opportunity to vote. So. Um, uh, all of the 435 seats in the U.S. House of Representatives and 35 of the 100 seats in the U.S. Senate uh, will be up for re-election. This is a pivotal election for who will be in those seats, what their opinions, what their values will be for this country for the foreseeable future. And in addition, uh, 36 governors and more than six thousand state legislators across the country will be also up either for re-election or there will be new seats um, that will be elected into. Um, here in Massachusetts, there are also important policy issues on the ballot, and we're going to talk a lot about those very spe specific ones that specifically relate to us and to children. Um, specifically, um, we're going to talk about the nurse to patient ratios and the transgender uh, anti-discrimination pieces that we have very uh, strong feelings and opinions about. So um, these issues are important to children's, um, and we therefore have taken a formal 
position. And I'm just going to very quickly state them and clearly there'll be an opportunity to have more uh, discussion as to the background and the rationale behind them. But uh, we stand in opposition to question one, that is a mandated nurse patient ratio limit. And we stand in support of question three on transgender anti-discrimination laws. So I'm just going to say that, and then you will hear from my colleagues um, as to what that really means and why. Um, Boston Children's has taken uh, these two uh, very critical policy because they have direct impact for children, not just within this institution, but across the state. And that's really important to us since so many of our children come from every town and every city in this community. Um, however, it's important to understand our nonpartisan approach to informing you about these issues. Um, nonprofit organizations such as ours uh, must remain nonpartisan and not take sides for a candidate or a political party. However, we're invited um, uh, you here today because of the complex policy issues so that you have a better understanding of what's behind them. That said, nonpartisan does not mean non-participation. Um, nonprofits like Boston Children's are able to participate in a variety of civic engagement activities, such as voter registration, which we are absolutely uh, working on, as well as voter education. Again, part of what we're doing today and why we're hosting this event. Um, we're allowed to take positions on ballot measures that are consistent with ensuring our mission. And I think I don't have to repeat, hopefully for anyone here, what that mission is. In our case, um, the mission that's driven us for 150 years is all about children. It's about their care, their well-being, a better quality of life. It's all those things that we stand for. It's about the next generation of care, the next generation of educating, the next generation of physicians. And it's about a better community. And, you know, as I always like to say, and people have heard me say that over and over again, although children represent only about 20, sometimes 25% of a population, they represent 100% of our future. And I say that now everywhere I go, whether I am doing something nationally, internationally, uh, locally, whether I do it with um, uh, policymakers, administration, whether I talk to employers or fundraisers. That is really what we have to keep in front of us every single day. So I just want to reiterate that because that's been my message uh, that Josh and our team um, are now taking and the trust and others are taking on the road with me. So um, your civic uh, participation, your civic responsibility is a very important part of that. And I think it's your um, your demonstrable way of uh, making that commitment beyond the walls of this institution and beyond what your specific roles and responsibilities are here at the hospital. So I encourage you um, to actively participate, to become educated, to really understand the issues, and then please go out and vote. Um, whatever your final votes are, we are not asking you to tell us what you're going to vote, um, but we do believe that that participation is essential so that the community, our legislators hear um, from all of us. So again, thank you for what you do every day. Um, this is really the most wonderful place that I have ever worked. It is a privilege to be here at Boston Children's and I hope you all feel that way too. So thanks for participating and I'm sure I'm gonna get the hook. So, <laughs> so uh, thank you. I will be here uh, clearly if there are questions, happy to try and answer them, but my colleagues will be there up here as well. So thank you all for coming. Great, thank you so much, Sandy. Okay, so we wanna start our discussion um, just following up a little bit on what Sandy said around remaining nonpartisan. And so I think this is an important disclosure um, to just get out of the way. So while we're going to be discussing elect, uh, the election today um, and the ballot, what we're not gonna be doing is discussing political candidates or political parties. So our conversation will remain nonpartisan. 
Um, it's important for all of you who are BCH employees in the room to know the remaining nonpartisan goes beyond just today's program. It means that when we're here at work, when we're representing Boston Children's Hospital, that we need to do that in a nonpartisan fashion. What we do outside of the hospital in our free time is completely up to us. Um, and we encourage you to be civically engaged um, and actively engaged with conversations in your community that may be political in nature in your free time. Um, that being said, we are going to be discussing ballot questions today, and I think it's important to highlight two very specific points um, in terms of our perspective here at Boston Children's. Number one, we're not here today to tell you how to vote. We know that there are going to be policy questions on your ballot that are very complex and very confusing. So our effort today is to make sure that you get the information that you need to make an informed decision and that we are being as transparent as possible about the policy positions that the hospital has taken on these issues. Number two, generally speaking, the Office of Government Relations here at Children's doesn't believe that complex policy issues should be solved on the ballot. We believe that those issues have a place in our state legislature, as well as our federal government, where there are checks and balances. There's a House and a Senate. There's opportunity to mitigate unintended consequences. The ballot process in terms of making policy tends to void all of that. So in general, we prefer to do policy making through a legislative process. But that being said, there are policy issues before us on the ballot that have direct impact for the hospital and the patients and families that we serve. So we did feel it important to take positions on those things and then be transparent about those positions. So general voter registration and education information. You'll notice on the back table, we have a variety of different important informational resources for you, one of which are these red books. So these are the Massachusetts voter guides that are put out by the Secretary of State's office, one of my favorite books that I read every year. Um, we have some on the back table. You should have gotten this in the mail if you are a registered voter in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I am a registered voter and I didn't get mine yet, so I'm very thankful that my employee employer has them here and available. Um, so feel free to grab one for yourself, take them back to your offices, um, make sure that you have access to those. You're free to share them with patients, families, and other employees. All of the information contained in the Red Book can also be found on wheredoivotema.com. That is a great website where you can register to vote, check your voter registration status. You can even get a sneak peek of your personal ballot before you go to vote. Now, a couple of important deadlines to keep in mind. In under a week, the deadline to register to vote in Massachusetts or update your voter registration will happen. That is October 17th. So if you have recently had a name change, if you've moved, if you're not sure where your polling location is, um, making sure that all of that is up to date and current and you have that can be found on wheredoivotema.com, but the deadline is October 17th. Perfect example that I just shared with somebody, I recently moved a half a mile down the street. Um, while I had to update my voter registration, it also moved my polling location a couple blocks over. So even if you've moved and you feel like it's not far, go to that website, double check, make sure you know before you go. The statewide election will happen on Tuesday, November 6th, but in addition, early voting will happen in the state October 22nd to November 2nd. Now, if you live in the city of Boston proper, like me, you can actually go to Boston City Hall during normal business, business hours and start voting as early as today. And that's actually through an absentee ballot process where you present yourself to City Hall. They'll ask you for your name, your address, all of that information. They will give you your ballot. You can complete it there, leave it there, and you are done. So this is really important information for all of you to know given your very busy schedules, but it's also information that we can share with patients and families who also may find it challenging to get to the polls just on that one given Tuesday to let them know that there are early voting options or absentee voting options um, and additional options if you live in the city of Boston. So now what is going to be on your ballot? So let's start discussing question number one. What is going to follow and what is on this slide right now is language exactly as it will appear on all Massachusetts statewide ballots. So when you go to vote, everyone in Massachusetts at the top of their ballot are going to see elections happening for statewide office like our governor's race. Uh, there's also a U.S. Senate race. Um, all of our uh, members of Congress are up for election. Below that, you'll see additional statewide offices. You'll see some local offices. So you're going to have to go down to the very bottom of your ballot to find the ballot questions. Um, in some cases, this may mean flipping your ballot over. 
So when you get to the very bottom, everyone in the state will see the same three questions. Now, depending on where you live, there may be more than three questions. For example, I have an additional fourth question based on where I live, but everyone will see the same question number one, number two, and number three. Question number one, as it will appear on your ballot, is on this slide. And it asks a question about a law proposed via initiative petition. Do you approve of a law summarized below on which no vote was taken by the Senate or the House of Representatives on or before March 2nd of this year? On its face, this doesn't tell you a lot. And this is why we're here today. This is why we're talking about it. If you don't have this information in advance, if you don't know what you're looking at, this question doesn't tell you a whole lot, right? But what it does tell you is that there's a summary to follow. This is a sample of the summary that you will see on your ballot. Again, this is exact language as taken from what will be on the ballots. However, there's a little asterisk next to summary and that's because this is a summary of the summary. The summary is so long that we couldn't fit it all on one slide. It contains about 13 distinct different parts and we pulled out about the top six. So at the end of the day, what question number one is asking is, do you want to limit how many patients could be assigned to a registered nurse in a Massachusetts hospital or covered entity? And this is in all hospitals, in all units, at all times. So that is the big picture of what this question is asking. Okay, a couple other points that I will highlight about this question is that um, in addition, it would require all Massachusetts hospitals to develop a written patient acuity tool to be utilized in all units with all patients. Violation, if this were to pass, would result and could result in up to $25,000 per day per violation fines. In addition, the question would require the Massachusetts Health Policy Commission, a quasi-governmental agency, to set up a 1-800 number as well as a website where complaints could be filed. They would also need to set up um, materials that would be made available for all hospitals and covered entities, which must then be posted in all hospitals, in all units, at all times, with the subsequent information about how and where to file complaints. Failure to comply with that aspect could also result in fines. Another important part of the question that I will note, this is when you look at the summary, the very, very last section of the question says that all of this must be done within 37 business days, meaning this would go into effect if, passed on no, uh, uh, if it passes on November 6th, it would go into effect on January 1st of 2019. That is 37 business days. Now at the bottom of your ballot, where it asks you to actually mark yes or no, you see what will be before you. The way ballot questions work, they are all or nothing. So a yes vote in the affirmative means yes, I agree in the affirmative to roughly all 13 parts of what I am being asked. A no vote does not change the current law. It leaves the current laws as is, and um, it, it doesn't take into consideration any of the pieces of what is in the 13 part question. So one of the biggest questions I get as I'm walking around and talking about this question is like, well, where is the information? Who has good data? Where can I read more? And this is the number one point of reference that I like to utilize because it is truly independent and it is not associated with either of the campaign sides of this ballot question. And this comes from the Massachusetts Health Policy Commission. And the Health Policy Commission recently did a free public analysis. It is available on their website. I can send it to you if you're having trouble finding it. Um, it's actually a great read. Uh, but what I did here is I wanted to pull out just the top three points that I thought were really salient from the Health Policy Commission report. And what this independent analysis found was number one, they took a look at costs. And they determined a rough estimate of anywhere in the neighborhood of 676 million to just about $1 billion in costs annually if this were to pass. Now, there were some limitations on this data collection. It did not include emergency departments, observation units, outpatient, or other costs like implementation of the acuity tool. Um, so it could be said that this estimate actually could go well over what is stated because of the limitations of the data analysis. 
Second, one of the things that the HPC looked at was like, well, how many nurses are we actually talking about? How many nurses would we have to bring into the fold by January 1st to be compliant with the law? And what they found was roughly 2,300 to over 3,000 nurses would be needed to be hired in that 37 business day period to make all Massachusetts hospitals and covered entities compliant with the law should it pass on the ballot. And then finally, one of the other questions I've got is like, well, where would very specifically the greatest impact be if this were to pass? And there are really three things that the Health Policy Commission highlighted. Community hospitals would receive as a hospital class the greatest impact in terms of having to hire nurses and the cost impact. Number two, in terms of nursing practice, the night shift would be greatly impacted. And then number three, kind of looking at service line delivery or units um, impacted would be med surge units. So taking, I'm sorry, uh, yes. Uh, and so taking all of that into consideration, Boston Children's Hospital, as Sandy mentioned, has taken an institutional position on ballot question one of no. So again, we are not telling anyone how to vote on this question. As we stated earlier, we prefer that complex policy questions, especially those involving healthcare, be solved in the legislature. So given all of those considerations, the complexity and the nature of the question, and that we just believe it's wrong for pediatric care delivery, we've taken an institutional position of no. I think it's important to note that we are not doing this in isolation. Boston Children's has joined with a broad-based statewide coalition of others who are also taking institutional positions of no. That includes seven different nursing organizations, all of the hospitals in the Commonwealth, including the community hospitals, other healthcare providers like the Mass League of Community Health Centers. Um, we're seeing groups such as um, major mental health advocacy groups, as well as individuals from the business community, um, providers such as um, physicians, psychologists, psychiatrists, et cetera. So we're not doing this in isolation. We are joining with many others who also share significant concerns about the question. So with that, I'm going to stop and ask uh, Laura Wood to come up to the stage. Laura is um, our chief nursing officer here, and I'm going to invite her to share a little bit of perspective, um, nursing perspective on this ballot question now that you have the technical background surrounding what is being asked. I'm going the wrong way here. Here we go. I wanted to just, uh, so thank you, Kate. And um, it's really a pleasure to be with you. And I wanted to start out by just describing a little bit of my role at Boston Children's and how it connects to the material that um, is part of the ballot initiative that's being proposed and the summary that Kate provided. So in my role as the chief nurse at Boston Children's, um, I have responsibility for the discipline of nursing um, for a workforce of approximately 2,000 frontline uh, nurses and advanced practice nurses who practice here every day in all settings. Um, with that um, comes a major focus on the care and nurturing of this workforce, providing um, an appropriate context for their practice, and also a focus on safe, quality, and effective care delivery. So balancing those two dimensions is really the core of my role and of our nursing leadership role at Boston Children's. The, the essence of this ballot initiative and the challenge that it poses um, in nursing um, is that we have a recommendation for somebody um, from a legislative standpoint and from a governmental perspective to assert certain rigid standards on how we practice. For me, the, one of the most essential pieces of work that nurses do is to determine hour to hour, shift to shift, what's required to optimize care in the care setting where they're responsible. And I do not believe that that work can happen from a distance. I believe it's very proximal. I believe it's very intimate. It needs to be adapted as um, circumstances change at the point of care delivery. And it's the very nurses who we entrust with the care and well-being of patients 
who I believe have to have the same authority to adapt staffing um, as they see fit um, within while you know in the process of delivering care. So this idea that we would um, define what resources are needed, that that would be appropriate, and that that's how we would uh, deliver care is really antithetical to how we practice here and I think in many places in the country. The authority is with the frontline teams um, and nurse leaders at a local level to really shape the, the staffing practices. Um, so with that, I want to just, I just want to comment on a couple, couple additional pieces here is that we all know that um, adequacy of resources is very important. I think that that's just, we, we all, when we're, um, when we have interaction with the healthcare system, we know that the adequacy of resources and the quality of resources is both, you know, really essential to the care being uh, done properly and effectively. The, um, the idea, though, that there would be a rigid set of staffing standards that are applied that may not be needed in some cases, but are being applied, um, and, you know, in the most nuanced way, and then likewise that um, resources would be expended perhaps at moments where they're not really needed and, um, and, and rather taking the autonomy and the authority for um, adding resources in other, other places and times when they are needed. So this is a very, um, a very, very important question for how we deliver care. It's important for hospitals. It's important to the profession of nursing. And I would argue it's important for every citizen in Massachusetts that this, this would fundamentally reshape, I believe, um, the nature of how, how, it, um, how Massachusetts citizens would experience care delivery. I think the, um, the, uh, the summary that Kate provided gives you a sense that um, there would be cascading challenges at a state level, most likely, with this rolling out. Um, what, what we have been focusing on here is making sure that we're taking second looks and, and, and uh, doing what we need um, to make sure that our staffing is, is um, optimized in all the right ways. And I will tell you that uh, that's something we pay attention to on a daily, on a daily basis. So this is not um, the recommendation that there would be government imposed staffing limits is not one that uh, fits with our philosophy and approach to staffing and to nursing practice at Boston Children's. So I'm gonna step away because we're gonna to transition to the next speaker, but I know I'm gonna have a chance to take questions and to talk further with you all uh, later in the program. So thank you for the opportunity to join you. Thanks, Laura. Um, we're gonna transition over to the next part of our program, which is on question three. And it's my privilege to be here today. My name is Jamie Gaines. I'm the government relations specialist. And today is National Coming Out Day. So not only are we talking about, <laughs> thanks Felix. Not only are we talking about a really important issue that's gonna impact the LGBTQ plus community, but we're talking about it on a day that's filled with celebration. So as Kate said, this is the question that you're gonna see exactly as it is written on the ballot. Do you approve of a law summarized below, which was approved by the House of Representatives and the Senate on July 7th, 2016? And let me just say, um, I work in government relations. I would have no idea what this was about if I didn't already know. These ballots can be a little bit confusing, so we're showing you the language that, as Kate said, you're fully ready when you go to the ballot. But question three is about transgender anti-discrimination. So in 2016, Massachusetts passed a law that protected transgender individuals from discrimination in all public spaces. We hear a lot about what public spaces are for the trans community. The first thing that comes to my mind is the bathroom bill. This is a lot more important than just bathrooms. Things that are included in public accommodations are healthcare facilities, restaurants, retail shops, theaters, sports facilities. Basically, anytime you're at home or you're at work, Anything else is a public space. For me, there's very little time in between those two spaces, but I hear a lot of other people are out in the world. Gender identity is what a person believes their own identity to be. It doesn't matter what you think their identity is. It's what they believe that it is, and it doesn't have to be associated with their biological sex. 
a yes vote on this would keep in place the current law that protects trans individuals and a no law would repeal this vote would repeal this current law this question can be a little tricky the way it's worded all you need to know is that yes keeps the current law in place and no would repeal it at children's we're really committed to providing an affirming and discrimination free environment for our patients our staff and all of our families that come through here and that's why we're really proud to stand with freedom for all massachusetts which you'll hear from in just a minute and support a vote of yes on question three we really want to make sure that trans protections stay in massachusetts and that we set an example for the rest of the country this is the first time that trans public accommodations and anti-discrimination laws are on the ballot in the entire country. We want to set a strong precedent that we support trans folks here in the state. We are not alone in this fight. As you can see, we have every member of the uh, New England sports teams, I hear they're called. And um, <laughs> along with Google and our Blue Cross Blue Shield friends, we have friends in healthcare and friends far beyond that are standing with us in this fight. And with that being said, I am going to turn it over to experts who are well steeped in this work. Karina Patel is the Coalition Director of Freedom for All Massachusetts, and she's going to share a little bit on what's been happening in this ballot question. So hi, everyone. I'm Karina Patel. I'm the Coalition Director of Freedom for All Massachusetts. So we are the Yes on Three campaign working to uphold our transgender non-discrimination law at the ballot. And really, it's about upholding dignity and respect for transgender people. Uh, just a disclosure, uh, our campaign is funded um, from a variety of sources, um, including uh, many corporations, nonprofits, uh, individuals, and unions. There's a slide missing. Uh, so basically, in, in 2011, the legislature passed a law that would protect transgender people in four important areas of their lives. So housing, employment, education, and credit. But not included in that legislation were protections for transgender people in public spaces or public accommodations. Um, it wasn't included because it was controversial. Legislators didn't want to vote on it. Our opponents made it about bathrooms. Uh, so the other four pieces passed and us advocates came back in summer of 2015. We launched Freedom Massachusetts with the sole goal of passing legislation that would protect transgender people in public accommodations. We built a very broad bipartisan coalition, um, which included hundreds of businesses, nonprofits, unions, universities, uh, public officials, safety advocates, faith leaders, and more. And our collective efforts had impact. In July of 2016, Governor Baker signed this into law. Uh, our victory was short-lived though, uh, literally, Two months after the governor signed it, our opponents got enough signatures to place this on the ballot. So in Massachusetts, you only need 32,000 signatures for a voter referendum, and they succeeded. And as Jamie pointed out, you know, we are the first state in the entire country to put a repeal of transgender rights on our ballot. And our opponents specifically picked Massachusetts. They knew that if they can win here, they can win anywhere in the country. And there was actually a quote uh, from our opponents here at the local level, the Mass Family Institute, from their president that said, if they can stop the transgender rights movement here, they can stop it anywhere in the country. And as I heard, you know, your patients come from all over the country. It's really important that not only do they have protections here in Massachusetts, but that they're protected um, in all areas of their life back home as well. So this has national implications. If our opponents win here, again, they can win anywhere. So my job as coalition director was to go back to uh, this huge coalition we built during the legislative campaign and say that our work is not over. Uh, we need to band together uh, one more time to help protect the law we got passed. And I wanna talk about some of the public polling. So earlier this summer, there were two public polls that were released. One was a Mass Inc. WBR poll. It put us at 52% in support of protecting or upholding the law. The other was a Boston Globe Suffolk University poll, and that put us at 49% in favor of upholding. And you may have seen this Globe story. The transgender rights question could be the closest 
vote in Massachusetts, this poll finds. So it's quite an alarming headline. You know, this, people think we're Massachusetts, we couldn't possibly repeal these protections here, but the polling shows otherwise. And then in the last few weeks, there were actually three polls that were released. Um, first, the Mass Inc. WBR poll that put us at 71%. Secondly, the Boston Globe Suffolk University poll that put us at 73. And just yesterday, a UMass Lowell poll put us at 74%. So I've been getting callers from, calls from prospective donors and supporters and volunteers saying, congratulations, you're doing great, you're all set, you've got this. But we have to warn them that these numbers are slightly misleading. Why, earlier the summer, the number was 50, around 50, now it's 70. We haven't jumped 20 points. It all comes down to how the question was asked. So earlier the summer, it was asked solely around bathrooms and locker rooms. This time around, it was asked more broadly um, about protecting transgender people in pub various areas of public accommodation, so not just bathrooms and locker rooms. So we know that once our opponents get up on the airwaves, which they've already started to do, they've released two ads, that these numbers will drop sharply closer to the 50% number because our opponents' messaging is rooted in misleading anecdotes and fears about what it means to be transgender. Uh, it's an effective message. They make it about bathrooms and locker rooms and the safety of women and children in them. And that's when we'll see closer to the 50% number and it's too close for comfort. So that's why uh, you know, we, need, we need people to take action. Again, this is not a slam dunk for us. Um, so there are various ways that you can help us um, in, working in, in protecting uh, this law. Um, the first is to fill out a postcard. So we have postcards back on the table. We just collect your information. We put it into our system so you'll get updates. But we actually mail those postcards back to you uh, in the days before the election, reminding you that you, you support this um, and to reminding you to go and vote. Uh, the second thing is volunteer. You know, a campaign, campaign like this requires a real robust field effort. Uh, we've been knocking on doors and calling people for over a year now because there's a huge public education component about educating people about what it means to be transgender and why these protections are so important. So we need one-on-one -on -one conversations with voters. So please uh, volunteer for a phone bank or Canvas. The third thing is spread the word. There are still so many people across the state that don't even know that this is on the ballot. So we need to we need to let people know that this is on the ballot and it's important to go and vote on this issue. Um, and also, you know, I work with a lot of businesses and nonprofits that have thousands of employees or thousands of members and communication is really important. And I know institutions like Boston Children's uh, have been communicating to people here uh, about this ballot question. Uh, so that's another really effective thing that organizations and businesses can do, just communicate about this. And, you know, a lot, we have a lot more information on our website. Um, just want to thank uh, Children's for your support of this issue. And um, we can talk more about questions later. Thank you. Thanks, Karina. So now I'm going to bring up Felix. Felix is a patient in our Gender Management Services Clinic, also known as the GEM Clinic. He's a transgender youth activist, and he is very much who I want to be when I grow up. So Felix, come on up, and he's going to share our story. Okay. So before I start, I also want to say happy national coming out day. Um, whether you are outed or still in the closet, I'm proud of you, and I love you all. So, <laughs> uh, hello, my name is Felix Marshall. I'm a 13-year-old boy and currently in the seventh grade. When I was younger, I actually despised my name. Um, I disliked it so much that whenever I went to the playground and introduced myself to potential new friends, I would not use my real name. Instead, I would be George, Frank, or most commonly, James. My interactions with new friends at the playground were pretty typical. Swing on the swings, play in the sandbox, and share it in general conversation. When the time came to talk about ourselves, I would often say something like this. 
well, I'm an athlete, I'm a brother, I'm a student, a writer, detective, astronaut, and a globetrotting veterinarian. I can say most of the same things now, scratch the detective and astronaut part, it's almost exact. <laughs> One thing that I never said, and that I still find hard to say, is that I was born as a girl. Uh, growing up, I was, a f I was free to be me. My parents just wanted me to be happy, so all I knew was that I liked playing with toy trucks and cars as well as dressing in blue. Oh, and not forgetting the part that I was a guy on Halloween for the past 13 years of my life, including my favorites, Bob Ross, Magnum P.I., and Edward Scissorhands. <laughs> Everything was fine until the inevitable happened. Puberty. I was so confused when these excruciating, horrible, incredibly terrible changes started happening to my body. It was as if my free spirit was saying, you can't be this anymore. It was the worst experience and quite literally stunk so much. Uh, no, I'm not talking about my armpits, which I did actually like and would find great pleasure in showing off my new armpit hair. <laughs> um, but it was hard being the only girl in school with short hair who dressed like a boy and who liked other girls. Towards the end of fourth grade, I finally knew what the heck was actually happening. I was a boy trapped in a girl's body. Over that summer, I told my parents that I was a boy. It was difficult for them to understand at first, but then things changed for the better. I was Felix, the Felix who I always was. I came out to school in fifth grade and got a puberty blocker to make my, the monsters on my chest stop growing. I'm currently eager to start the next step in my journey, testosterone. I love my visits to GEMS because they see me for who I am and are helping me become the person I want to be. Now that you know about me, I can continue here uh, with, bleh, I can continue with what I came here to share with you. Reiterating this, two years ago, our, our governor, Charlie Banker, put into law that no one could get discriminated against based on their gender identity in public places, including restrooms, restaurants, movie theaters, and more. Immediately after, a group called Keep Massachusetts Safe collected 32,000 signatures to put it on the ballot. It's now up to public debate, and unfortunately, this group is using fear to get people to remove these protections for kids and adults like me. Being trans is not a choice. It's just who I am. Am I different? Of course I am, but so is a platypus. <laughs> Talk about a crazy creature, but do you go to the zoo and say, stop that, you can't be a combination of all of these animals and still exist? It's crazy, right? I mean, <laughs> how is the human race any different? We all come in different shapes, sizes, and colors. So, but we also breathe all, the, uh, we also all breathe air and pump blood to live. Don't we all deserve the right to exist, especially without discrimination? The only alternative would be to make everyone the same and it would be, and if everyone and everything were exactly the same, life would be really, 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 really boring. <laughs> um, everyone should be accepted for who they are. And as my grandfather who passed away last, last October would have said, you can be a horse for all I care. <laughs> I didn't share this speech with you just to advocate for myself, but for other gender expansive individuals as well. For kids, it is so hard to think about being denied services because of what's between your legs. But what we don't always consider is how hard it must be for queer adults who have transitioned later in their lives. Throughout my transition, I have been lucky to receive support from my family, friends, this hospital, and so, so many others. But it will not be enough. We need to keep these protections in place, and I can't do it by myself. Unfortunately, being 13, the state of Massachusetts will not accept my vote. <laughs> um, so I need you to go out and vote yes on three and encourage others to do so. My mom over there in the front um, is encouraging, uh, my mom is making me ask you to consider a yard sign as she has tons that we need to get out of my sister's room. <laughs> or post on social media to others that you support keeping this law in place. What an amazing message it would be, uh, it would send if, the, if this law uh, not only stays intact, but does so with flying colors. It would be a message to everyone that love always wins. Thank you. I'm not crying, you're crying. <laughs> um, Felix, thank you so much for sharing your story and Felix's family, thank you for being here. We're so lucky to have a rock star patient like you join us today. 
So with that, um, I'm going to invite our presenters to come up and grab a seat, and we're going to transition over to the question and answer portion of our day. So if you have written a question down um, on your note card, please hold it up, and our fabulous intern Geraldine in the back will collect it and bring it up. I'm going to invite Kate Audette to join us as well. There are name tags, but you can sit wherever. So Geraldine is walking around the room with a blue basket. So if you have a question in the room, just hold up your note card. Geraldine will come and receive that from you. If you are live streaming, please feel free to write your questions in the chat box um, and those will be delivered to us as well. All right, so while Jamie is collecting questions, um, I will kick it off with um, somewhat of a question and then kind of answer it myself, I guess. Karina did a great job of talking about some of the polling around question three, and I'm regularly getting questions about polling on question one. And what I will say is that the same polling that was done yesterday on question three was done on question one, and it continues to poll very closely. So every single vote is going to matter on question one um, and the polling continues to be pretty consistent that it is very close. So with that, first question that we have says, how is it that on question one the ads say that 84% of nurses support yes on one? And if it's okay, Laura, can I do the technical answer and then I'm going to turn it over to you for some nursing commentary. So um, by show of hands of folks in the room, how many have seen this ad and know what this question is referring to? Virtually everyone. So on the ads that you're hearing and seeing, it says 84% of nurses in Massachusetts are voting yes on question one. The way that that um, question, the way that that ad came about was a result of data that was collected earlier this summer. The data was collected by a survey that was conducted over a period of about a month within the membership of the Massachusetts Nurses Association. MNA, the writers of this ballot question, represent about 23,000 of the 125,000 nurses in the state. And they got roughly 300 of their 23,000 members to respond. Of that 300, 86% responded in the affirmative. Um, where this becomes a little misleading the data collection on this happened before we knew that this was going to be a ballot question. So the data collection happened while this ballot question was still being litigated in Massachusetts courts. And it also happened before the question was assigned a number. So the ads say 86% of nurses are voting no on question one. When the data was collection, we actually collected, we actually didn't know what question one was going to be yet. Um, so that is kind of the very technical background on where that 86% comes from and why we have some concerns with how it was collected and how it's framed. Laura, anything you want to add? I think that should work. There we go. So, yes, yeah, so there's the summary statistics and how the survey was completed. I, I really think behind that is the uh, what is the voice of nursing in Massachusetts on the topic of the ballot legislation? And so what I would say as somebody who is interacting with dozens if not hundreds of nurses on a daily basis is that, at, and many of them at Boston Children's, some outside of Boston Children's, is that nurses want to lead and direct their own practice. That is a clear and direct message. Um, I think that's that's different than me trying to forecast how the election um, and how the ballot um, may play out over time. But I can tell you that there's a very clear sense within Boston Children's that that nurses here believe this is central to their professional practice. They believe they're they are um, providing uh, appropriate and exceptional care, and they really um, have disdain for the idea that there would be. Um, someone else or a government agency that would somehow sit in the middle of this process. So that is a very clear message. The footnote I'll put on that and the asterisk is, you know, that they're counting on the organization and on me and all of us to work together to continue to do what we've done for 150 years now, which is to work together to continue on a daily basis to make sure that we staff in ways that, that fit what's required. And Laura, let's stay with you if we can. We have a number of questions on number one, and then we'll move over to Felix and Karina. Um, so we have a question which I think we touched on a little bit already, but just to clarify, the question asks, who developed 
the actual limits that are listed in ballot question number one. Um, and the answer to that would be the Massachusetts Nurses Association. They are the authors of question one. In addition, we have a question that explain uh, a question that says, um, can you explain the origins of question number one, who supports it and why? So very quickly, this issue is one that has been around for about the last 20 years in this state. Um, it has existed as legislation that has been filed before the state legislature for the last 20 years. And by and large, the state legislature has declined to take up the issue or has taken it up and not gotten it past the finish line for a variety of reasons. Um, folks may remember in 2014, the Mass Nurses Association made an effort to get this question on the ballot and it was essentially resolved in the legislature via the creation of nurse staffing ratios in ICUs. Um, they are now back this time trying to expand on that through the ballot to all hospitals and covered entities at all times. So they are the leading organization who is working on the side of yes, um, but they are joined by other organizations and that information is um, readily available online. Laura, I want to direct this next question to you. Um, it says, nursing practice uses evidence-based practices. Can you provide a dialogue and share with the community uh, the results of the California experience? And one thing I will flag before turning it over to you, Laura, is that this report that I keep referencing from the Health Policy Commission, a truly independent, very current report, actually took a look at the California experience. So um, I would reference that if you're somebody who is very evidence-based and data-driven and you're looking for something concrete and truly independent, um, that reflects some research on the California experience. But Laura, do you want to speak to evidence-based practices or the California experience? Sure, Kate, and, and I do recommend that report. I think it's a, a really tight synthesis on this topic. Um, a couple key things to note from California, and you may or may not know this, but as they rank states nationally um, around healthcare outcomes and quality, Massachusetts is highly ranked, and I believe, Kate, do my fact checking here, I believe we're ranked four in the country. I believe California is ranked 19th. Um, so we already are in a, um, in really a small inner circle of those who are leading the country in terms of care quality and outcomes. Um, and I would say in large measure that um, this is a function of both uh, excellent medical care, but nursing is really at the heart of the care delivery system. And so what we do with nurse staffing and the, the foundation that we have for already has already demonstrated that um, what we're doing should be sustained. Um, I worry that we will um, inherit a set of guidelines that actually could, could pull resources into places where they could be less valuable and we would spend money in the wrong places and it could actually have a very adverse impact in terms of both quality of care and access. So those are concerns that, that weigh on me. But um, to just finish out Kate's question about the California experience specifically, there's a wide range of studies done by leading uh, folks and economists, some in nursing, some outside of nursing. Um, as I sift the evidence, the, the, um, the majority of the evidence really directs me to say that, um, that the work in Massachusetts is, is grounded in ways that are um, really elevating the possibility of strong quality going forward. I, I think California is a failed experience. Thank you, Laura. So now I'm going to turn it over to Karina and Felix, but first I have something that is not a question, but it's great, so I just want to read it. It says, I had to leave early, but Felix, you are absolutely amazing and so brave for sharing your story with us. You are loved and supported. So next we have a question for Karina and or Felix, whoever wants to address it. Are there other states with anti-discrimination laws? Hello? Okay. Yes, so there are 19 other states that uh, have non-discrimination laws that protect at least in housing, employment, and public accommodations. So the most recent is actually New Hampshire, which happened uh, two months ago. So if, if we repeal these protections here in Massachusetts, we would be the only state in New England without these protections. Uh, there are 27 states that have no protections whatsoever, and then there are a few states that have a patchwork of protections. But yeah, there's 19 states that fully protect transgender people. 
Great, thank you. We have another question going back to question one regarding nurses in areas less well staffed and supported. Do we know how question one would affect them? Um, so yeah, I think that is the general question. For nurses in other less well staffed supported areas, do we know their opinions and how this would affect them? So again, not to sound like a broken record, but I would refer folks back to the Health Policy Commission report um, regarding potential impact. And one example that I'll highlight is they noted the impact that if this passes would have on community hospitals. And as Boston Children's Hospital, we are not a community hospital, but we're concerned about our community community hospital partners and their ability to continue to deliver high quality pediatric care should this pass. Um, one of the things we've heard from community hospitals is, well, to avoid the penalties associated with this, if it passes, we may shutter units or we may close beds. And so we have questions about, well, which beds and units would those be? And what is the larger impact on the healthcare system and specifically in pediatrics? So while we know that there are lots of complex healthcare challenges in this state, senior staffing possibly being one of those, we continue to go back to this idea that solving those complex challenges should not be done on the ballot. These are conversations that we should be having in the legislature. Laura, anything else you want to add? Uh, fully agree and would just simply say that, um, you know, while the, while the, um, Kate, I'm just paying attention to, um, so, so in terms of the smaller community hospitals. Yeah, this is um, asking about the impact of those areas. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so I want to go back, I just want to go back to mm -hmm. the idea that, you know, while we're focusing on nursing and, and um, the fact that all staffing is, is not equal in hospitals in Massachusetts, we know that today. The question is, um, is this about nursing or is this about um, the, the community benefit of healthcare more broadly? And I think it's, it's this, there's a very tight intersection about how nursing resources are applied in order to support the uh, health and well-being of all citizens in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So it's this it's this calibration between um, getting it right for the nursing workforce and getting it right for patients and families. And it's a really delicate calibration. Again, I just come down on the side that the ballot is not the way to improve that process. It may not be optimized in every hospital in the Commonwealth, but I, I just strongly believe this is not the approach. Thanks, Laura. So we are out of time, but if there are questions we didn't collect, please still make sure to put them in the chat box and get them to Geraldine, and we will try to answer those um, either through our newsletter or other channels. So with that, can you join me in giving a round of applause for all of our amazing speakers today? Thank you all so much for taking time out of your very busy schedules to get this information and get informed. We do ask that you fill out the evaluation form. Those are really helpful in our office planning future programs such as this. So thank you all so much and enjoy the rest of your day. One other thing, there is voter registration outside the hospital and all hubs across the hospital for the entire day. Register to vote, get an absentee ballot, learn about early voting. Um, we'll be there, we'll be right next to the national coming out table and come stop by if you have any questions. Thank you all so much.